one of the most common questions I get asked about auras is whether they really look like the photos or is most of that just trickery with the camera? What we see with the human eye does look different to what the camera sees. Let's explore why that is. On a very dark night in Arctic Norway, I find myself standing on a mountain pass, looking up at the northern lights as they dance above my head and out across the nearby fjord. Before I start taking my time-lapse sequence, I take a test shot and make sure my focus and composition are in good order. I look down at the camera screen and wow, it makes me pause to suddenly see the rich red tones that outline more visible green bands of Aurora. That moment becomes far more exciting now that I can see all those colors, even though most of them are visible only through the rear screen of my camera. Some nights we do have to wait very patiently for the Northern Lights to appear, or as I like to call them in Norway, the Nordlis. They appear when they appear and not before. And even then what you actually get to see will depend very, very much on how close to the Aurora Oval you are located. If you're too far east or south from the Nordlis, then maybe all you get is to see a soft glow on the distant horizon. When they are gentle, it can be hard to tell if you're seeing a band of cloud or an actual aurora band. But when they are powered by strong solar winds and dancing high above your head, there is no doubt at all. It is really obvious and a wonderful sight for human eyes. But what does the camera see in comparison to what our eyes see? For sure, the camera will always see more than our eyes can, always. On a good night, the auroras are bright and you can clearly see their familiar green hue with your own eyes. On a really good night, you might even see the red tones too. But the light our eyes see is very different to what our cameras can assemble. The camera can pick up so much more. Seeing so many Aurora photos online these days really does create an expectation for people that can't always be met. That's what I really want people to appreciate before they make plans to visit the Arctic. Auroras are not only fickle and unpredictable to get a sight of, but they might be disappointing for you if you're expecting to see the YouTube version. What you see on Instagram or YouTube or other social media platforms is not what you are going to see with your own eyes. Which doesn't mean it's not an amazing sight, just that the photos are usually much brighter and more vibrant than in real life. On a modest night with low level solar activity, I look at the shots taken on my cheap smartphone and they are kind of dirty and dark and a little bit blurry. And maybe that's a better indication of what we humans see. The worse your photography, the more accurate the photo is. During a high level Aurora event, things are a little different. We often find ourselves just standing still and looking directly up to the night sky, marveling at the motion and speed and light and colors and intricate patterns of ribbons and coronas. On nights like these, I let the time-lapse mode on the camera keep working while I enjoy the motion and magic through my own eyes. One thing I wanna show you now is a rendering of an Aurora time-lapse, but degraded in post-processing to give you a sense of what the human eye sees in comparison to the camera. For starters, the scene is much darker to our eyes as we struggle to pick up such low levels of light. We also struggle for contrast. So everything seems very flat compared to the pixel sharp rendering on a camera. And with low contrast comes low saturation. The colors are there, but they're difficult to discern until the brightest bursts come through. If we just stand and stare at the night sky, however, we can totally appreciate the magic of what's happening up there. It's still very, very special, even if it's not in Technicolor tones. The thing is, even though our eyes see so much less than a camera does, the experience is still wonderful. Don't forget that our eyes are accustomed to seeing very little in the night. So suddenly having all this activity and even a hint of color up there is genuinely impressive. We are suddenly deeply immersed in that moment and our senses are filled to the brim. We only compute the spectacle as dark or low contrast when we compare our vision 
against the back of the camera. I think something extra happens inside our brains too. I think that our neurons rebuild an image in our memory that is somehow richer and more full of colors. We translate what our eyes see to be something closer to the photographic version. That's what the human brain does best anyway. It translates little bits of sensory input and builds a customized version of the world inside our brains. Capturing photographs definitely changes the experience. In some ways, it makes it better. We have a more vivid keepsake of that moment, and it gives me a reason to stand out in the cold, freezing my ears off for hours on end, even on those quieter nights when the aurora is low and slow. The camera can still pick out the colors our eyes struggle to see. But why does the image on the camera and the view through my eyes look so different? The brightest auroras are roughly comparable to moonlight, which is right at the edge of useful light for most humans. We have evolved to do our best work in the daytime. And that's the nub of it. Humans just don't see lower levels of light as clearly as our high-tech cameras do. With each generation of technology, our cameras can produce higher quality and more pleasing images with less and less light. There are three ways a camera can pick up auroras better than the human eye. The high ISO settings, very slow exposures, and the effect of time lapse. It's not just the colors that get lifted by the sensitivity of camera sensors, but motion as well. When shooting time lapse, we're speeding up our perception of time and how far and fast the auroras move. We can turn 20 minutes of gentle movement into 20 seconds of rapid dancing. And the thing is, there really are times when the Nautilus move that fast. They really do ripple overhead and create ribbons, sometimes. Indeed, the problem on such evenings is that our cameras have usually been set up previously for slower exposures that are going to give us a high quality image. And then suddenly everything's changed and the exposure settings we have are overwhelmed by a more dynamic phase. So when you see a time lapse posted to social media, it can give you a very different impression to the experience of standing out there watching. It is even possible to shoot video of auroras these days. You need really, really high ISO and ideally a very fast lens. So these videos often look a little bit plastic or just strange, but it is possible. I don't mind the poor quality video when it reveals those moments of an aurora dancing fast in real life. I often get asked what it is that I do to my images when I process the raw files. And the answer is not much really. I'm relying on getting as much right in the camera as possible. The raw file is only being tuned up a little bit. The real question when it comes to the treatment of raw files should be, what style do I want to present? Some people really like to crank the saturation on these things. I think most people take it too far. And that's one reason travelers often have crazy expectations when they arrive in the Arctic. They think they will see with their own eyes the same thing everyone is cranking in Photoshop. Just a quick glance through thumbnails of Aurora videos on YouTube will give you a good idea of what I mean by oversaturated. These look just awful. And that's the problem with social media. The most extreme version of most things is often what gets the most attention. The same with the saturation dial. I also think geography plays a big part in this too. If you're not standing in Tromso on the night of a big aurora, and all you get to see at your end of the globe are some faint glows on the distant horizon, then you may not realize how far you're distorting your images in order to try and match what folks are seeing elsewhere on the planet. You can end up using post-processing to try and compensate, to try to match your image with what you see on social media. And it's a real trap because you want your images to look the same as everyone else's on Instagram, right? I prefer to step back and go the other way. I prefer to step away from those crazy colors and keep it more subtle. I just prefer more natural and subdued tones, which is easy for me to say when I'm up here in Tromso getting really great shows of the Northern Lights. I'm already getting rich colors because of the higher ISO ability of my camera, because of my fast lenses, the slow exposures, and simply being in the right place at the right time. I'm starting with the beautiful scene anyway. 
there's just no need for me to amp it up further. Cameras in the human eye do see auroras differently. That doesn't mean the camera is distorting the moment. Sometimes the photography is distorting things with the saturation slider, that is true, but the camera is just doing what the camera does. It's collecting light as best as it can and rendering that into an image. This isn't like an AI thing. Cameras are collecting actual light that really is there. It's just that they do it so much better than the human eye. Many times I've enjoyed some great Aurora evenings while my camera is shooting in time-lapse mode and then I look down to check out what my camera is doing only to be surprised by the strong presence of red colours in addition to the green. Our cameras will pick up the red tones in particular with far greater sensitivity than us mere humans. One of my favourite things when chasing auroras is moonlight and twilight because you get a nice blue sky instead of a dark black one and I just like this a lot. I even schedule my travels around the moon phases so that I get plenty of bold, strong moonlight to work with. There's a kind of additive effect when you have the moonlight, and that is when you see the most vibrant green hues the most strongly, both in camera and through the eyes. When you compare a moonlight aurora to a totally black night, and the difference is quite amazing. I like both, but for different reasons. Moonlight is great when you want to capture the landscape as well and bring that into your compositions. Capturing auroras is a deeply technical form of photography and it can be very difficult to capture one at all, just to get yourself in the right place at the right time. That's part of the joy for me, the chase of it. But elevating from a green blur to a work of art is even more of a challenge. I don't just want a photo that proves I saw an aurora. I want to make something artistic and beautiful with it. I'm a photographer. I especially love the connection between the snowy Arctic landscapes and the Nautilus and how on a dark night the colours of the sky also paint in an otherwise white landscape. The snow picks up the greens and the reds just like the camera does. Green snow, however, can look very odd in compositions. Most people think it looks kind of fake, even though what you're shooting is what actually happened. So you see, there's always a gap between what the camera sees and what the human eye expects to see. That's just how it is. The other challenge with auroras is that they don't always kick off on a big scale. Most aurora events are actually more gentle. Indeed, most people are not even in the right part of the globe to even see an aurora event unless it's something really special and really big. If you're a couple of hundred miles to the south of the aurora oval, it's just going to be a lot smaller and lower down on the horizon. Even if you do fly to a great place like Tromso that sits right under the Aurora Oval, you can't expect to be guaranteed a good showing of Aurora on any given night. You might get lucky and fly in for one night and see it. That happens and that's really great for those people. But some people stay for a week and all they get are clouds or snow. My last tour we saw the lights on 7 out of 14 nights, but mostly through gaps in the cloud. Most of the totally clear skies we had at night occurred on nights when the aurora wasn't dancing at all. But every now and then we get both perfectly clear skies plus long and varied aurora event. Those are the nights you would be glad you did not sleep in. On the 3rd of March 2024, we had just such a night. A little cloud was flirting with the horizon from the south when we sat down to dinner. At 7.30pm, I stepped outside to check for stars. Another way of saying, is there any cloud cover out there? And I noticed a gentle aurora starting up in the west. There was still some cloud about, but we headed outside with our cameras and started shooting anyway. 
For the next six and a half hours, we took photos. Some of our team decided to call the night by around 10.30 p.m. They were tired. And by this time, the clouds were totally gone and they felt they'd seen a really great show. And they weren't wrong. They enjoyed auroras pulsing above their heads and dancing like silk out across the fjord. Those few hours had moments of bright intensity when the green hues really punched through to the human eye. I too felt I had plenty of shots from our location at the cabin, so I drove up the road to try a new location. A new pattern of auroras emerged at this stage as the aurora oval slipped to the south and moved into a higher energy event. It would be another five hours before I got to bed. This was a big night. With an aurora event of KP2, most of the aurora oval is directly over Tromso. At KP5, it's a lot further south and a lot bigger. So the great thing about Tromso is that we get super lovely views to shoot in either of these different kind of scenarios. As this level five event on March the 3rd started to build, we could see the red tones making ribbons to the southwest. I love these patterns, and so does the camera. What seems to the human eye like a pinch of activity in the sky can turn out to be intense and striking reds when you get to look at the raw fire. Not only does a digital sensor pick up the red hues better than the human eye, but an ultra wide 14 millimeter lens changes your perspective too. Instead of being vertical ribbons that pulse across the horizon, the tall perspective generated by a 14 millimeter lens makes them look more angular at the edges. It looks as if they move outwards across the landscape from the middle of the frame instead of vertically up and down. It's a nice effect, but does make composition through the lens quite different to what your eyes are seeing. 14 millimeter pulls in a very, very big sky. What is lost through the camera on these really big nights is scale. That 14 millimeter lens brings in a huge amount of sky and in some ways can make the aurora seem a little small. And yet at the same time, it also fails to bring in the 360 degree view we experienced. You don't get any sense of the scale beyond the frame. So it simultaneously crops and minimizes these incredible moments. This is one reason I enjoy a time-lapse approach because at least you get a sense of movement over time and the idea that the sky is not static. But also note that time-lapse can be misleading to people that always appreciate that in a 20 second clip you are seeing maybe 20 minutes of Aurora activity. I get asked about this every time I post an Aurora time-lapse to my social media. It works great for long and slow Aurora events, but it looks almost silly for the very, very fast ones, such as the incredible Aurora that burst into action over the skies of Norway on March 3 this year. Not only was that night just way too fast for my four second exposure, but also too bright. I actually blew out the exposure in some sections, having set up my initial exposures to capture the more delicate red hues earlier in the evening. One final challenge I wanna leave you with is that Aurora photography not only demands a very fast lens to capture the moment, but a very wide lens as well, hence the 14 millimeter used in this series. In the Arctic, we see them cover 180 degrees of the horizon at a time, stretching from one horizon to the other. Sometimes they're literally lighting up the sky in every direction. So a 24 millimeter lens is just not nearly good enough. Anyway, I talk more about how to shoot auroras in another video. So if you wanna learn a little bit about how to chase them and set up to capture them, please take a look at that video next. Have a great day.